Good morning. It's a great day to worship the Lord. You're here with us virtually at First Presbyterian Church in Covington, Virginia. My name is Becca Young. I'm the temporary supply pastor. And we are very thankful that you choose to worship with us this morning. I am going to have in this service, we will be having our organist play. However, I want to warn you that there's no one here to sing and I'm hesitant to sing myself. <laughs> so I'm going to put the words on the screen and I'm hoping that you are there at home and willing to sing along with the hymns. We're going to do first, Oh God, our help in ages past. And then we're going to sing Amazing Grace. We'll sing two verses of each and you'll be accompanied by Sandra Mentor, our organist who will be playing in the background. We'll also have several prayers. I'll give you both some time for you to pray by yourself. And then I also will pray. And at the end of the pastoral prayer, we will pray together the Lord's Prayer using debts and debtors. It will also be on the screen. So now, let us worship the Lord our God. Psalm 121, Assurance of God's Protection, a Song of Ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. God will not let your foot be moved. The one who keeps you will not slumber. The one who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Let us pray. God of all glory, on the first day you began your new creation, bringing light out of the darkness. On this first day you began your new creation raising Jesus Christ from the darkness of death. On this Lord's day, grant that we, the people you create by water and the spirit, may be joined with all your works in praising you for your greater glory. Through Jesus Christ, in union with the Holy Spirit, we praise you now and forever. Amen. Will you join me in the hymn, O God, Our Help in Ages Past? Brothers and sisters, the grace of God overflows for us through Christ Jesus, who came into the world to save sinners. The proof of God's amazing love is this, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God in confidence. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. We will begin with a silent prayer of confession, and then I invite you to join me in the printed confession. Let us pray. Dear Lord, if you are even the slightest bit as critical of us as we are of others, 
then there is no hope for us. But you are not. We wish we could be like you, but we haven't done very well. Perfect though you are, Jesus, you made it clear you didn't come to condemn the world. So why should we, as imperfect as we are, why should we notice other people's mistakes and failures when we are guilty of them ourselves? Please forgive our arrogance. Make us joyously unaware of others' inadequacies, while at the same time ever aware of our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray as we begin to prepare ourselves to hear the word. Open now our hearts, dear Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may obey your will. In Christ's name, by the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 12 through 21. Listen for the word of the Lord. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the early years of the 20th century, there was an Orthodox monastery in Eastern Europe. The monastery had fallen on hard times. In previous centuries, it was the mother house of a great monastic order. But after hundreds of years of persecution of religious orders, and in an age which believed that orthodoxy was no longer relevant to people's lives, the abbot and four monks at the monastery knew themselves to be the last members of the order. For the five remaining monks hadn't been able to attract any younger folk to join them. Since each of these monks was over the age of 70, the order was doomed. In the deep woods surrounding the monastery, there was a little hut that a rabbi from town occasionally used for retreat and contemplation. Being a great holy man, the monks could feel his presence in the woods when he was there. It occurred to the abbot to visit the rabbi's cabin and ask the rabbi if he could offer any advice that might save the monastery. When the rabbi saw the abbot coming up the path, he went out to greet him and bring him inside. But when the abbot explained his question, the rabbi could only grieve with him. I know how it is, he said. The spirit has gone out of the people. It's the same in my town. Almost no one comes to the synagogue anymore. So the old rabbit and the rabbi wept together. When the time came for the abbot to leave, they embraced each other as they parted. It's been a wonderful thing that we should meet after all these years, the abbot said. But is there anything you can tell me? Some advice that could help save my dying order. I'm sorry, said the rabbi. I have no advice to give. The only thing I can tell you is that the Messiah is one of you. When the abbot returned to the monastery, his cam companions gathered around him to ask, well, what did the rabbi say? He couldn't help, the abbot answered. We just wept together. The only thing he did say 
just as I was leaving, it was something cryptic. It was that the Messiah is one of us. I, I don't know what he meant. In the days and weeks and months that followed, the old monks pondered the rabbi's words. The Messiah is one of us? Could he possibly have meant one of us monks here at the monastery? If that's the case, which one? Do you suppose he meant the abbot? Mm, yes, if he meant anyone, he probably meant Father Abbot. After all, he's been our leader for over 20 years. But if he meant Father Abbot, why didn't he just say so? On the other hand, he might have meant Brother William. Brother William is so gentle and kind. We all know he's truly a holy man. But surely he didn't mean Brother Mark. Ooh, Mark is so annoying to be around, although, you know, if you look back on it, even though Brother Mark can be so hard to get along with, he does always seem to be right. In fact, in everything he says, he's exceedingly right. Maybe the rabbi meant Brother Mark. But the rabbi couldn't possibly have meant Andrew. Andrew, he's so passive, he's a real nobody. But, you know, almost mysteriously, he has a gift that somehow he's always by your side whenever you need him. He just magically appears. Maybe Andrew is the Messiah? As they contemplated in this manner, the old monks began to treat each other with extraordinary respect on the off chance that one of them might indeed be the Messiah. And on the off, off chance that each monk himself might be the Messiah, they began to treat themselves with extraordinary respect. Because the forest in which the monastery was situated was beautiful, people still occasionally came to visit, to picnic on its tiny lawn, or to wander along its paths. As they did so, without even being conscious of it, they sensed this aura of extraordinary respect that now began to surround the five old monks and seemed to radiate out from them and permeate the atmosphere of the place. There was something strangely attractive and even compelling about it. Hardly knowing why they began to come back to the monastery more frequently, to picnic, to play, and even to pray. They began to bring their friends to show them this special place and their friends brought their friends. And then it happened that some of the younger folks who came to the monastery started to talk more and more with the older monks. And after a while, one asked if he could join them, and then another, and another. And so within a few years, the monastery once again became a thriving order that, thanks to the rabbi's cryptic gift, became a vibrant center of light. And they say still that if you stumble across this place where there is life and hope and kindness and graciousness, where the truth of their life is based upon the source of their strength and the richness of their life together, that secret still pervades that monastery. The Messiah is one of us. This is a beautiful story and one that truly resonates, I believe, with what Jesus is trying to say to us in this gospel passage that we have just heard. This passage comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has gathered his disciples around him on this mountaintop, his followers, he's building a new community and he's giving them instructions on how he would have them live, guidance for how he wants them to love one another. Now, when we hear this list, we tend to think of it as a sin list of instructions Jesus has for how we are to behave, as though it's some kind of manual that we are supposed to follow. There's a whole long list that goes along. Jesus starts with love one another as yourself. If Turn the other cheek. Walk the second mile. Give your coat and your cloak. Love your enemies. Pray without ceasing. Judge not. And now here in this passage, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We tend to think of this as some kind of list of rules that we're supposed to behave and follow in order to get God to love us, to have God pat us on the head and say, yes, come on into heaven. You deserve it. You earned it. But this is what I call the manual mentality. Too many of us look at the Bible as a manual 
that God has given us for how we should behave as if we're supposed to take the manual and go back to our room and read it and study all the rules. And if we just try hard enough, obey all the things God's telling us to do there. But this isn't what it is at all. In fact, what the Bible actually is, is a love story about how much God loves humankind. And that love story starts from the very beginning. In the book of Genesis, the very first two chapters, what does God do? God creates this beautiful universe just in order so that we will have a place to live. So God will have an other outside of God to relate to and to love and to, for a place to live this beautiful universe. If you doubt me, just go outside right now, staying six feet away from all other people, of course, but go out and enjoy this beautiful spring, the flowers in bloom, the trees on, the leaves on the willow tree, the calves frolicking in the pasture, the beauty of this bouquet that God has given us, the best bouquet that someone in love ever gave to the one they loved. And then in the book of Exodus, the Hebrew slaves are trapped under the oppression of the Pharaoh. Do they do something good in order to get God to love them? No, before they even know who God is, God comes into their lives and rescues them in the midst of their despair and leads them out from that oppression and then is present with them for 40 years as they wander and do all kinds of crazy things that would make anybody give up, but not God. God continues to love them with an unbreakable love. And in that love, <laughs> you can even look, you want to know more about that love now. Read, go to the prophet Hosea, more of the love story. Hosea decides to marry a prostitute named Gomer, which sounds crazy, but Homer with his life, wants to show in reality that God loves Israel even when Israel sells itself to other gods, to kings, to worldly possessions and fame and status. God still loves Israel in the midst of that. And so this to me is the core of this story that of the Bible story of God's love for us. God is the ultimate pay it forwarder that God already paid it forward to us and then asks us, to pay it forward to ourselves and to those around us with our love for them. And then it gets even better because we, now we get to the New Testament. And now Jesus, in Jesus Christ, God has done the most amazing thing of all. The creator of the universe decides that God wants to be one of us. The Messiah is one of us. This would be like those of you who do handicrafts, maybe if you make clay pots, let's say. Did you ever want to become one of your clay pots and sit on the shelf with the other clay pots? Of course not. But God, our creator, loves us so much that God decided to be one of us. The Messiah is one of us. In Jesus Christ, God comes just to hang with us because God loves us so much. But even more than that, and getting away from this manual mentality, God just doesn't tell us what to do in a list of rules. God gives us Jesus, comes as Jesus himself to show us how to do that love because everything God did, everything God did in Jesus, as long as Jesus was on this earth, was to show love and to treat every other person as a human being as well with that same kind of love. So God doesn't give us a manual. God says, when you need to know what to do, look to Jesus Christ. And then still, in this wonderful love, God also doesn't leave us alone to do this. God gives us a community in which we do this. Remember, Jesus is speaking to his community and asking them to do this kind of love, show this kind of love for one another. That's why I think this Messiah in the monastery book story is so excellent, so perfect, because it's showing us that we are to be the Messiah for each other and to see the Messiah in those around us. And so Jesus doesn't leave us alone to do all of this. You know, every single time in the Sermon on the Mount, when you see the word you, remember, Jesus in his original language would be using the plural you, 
In other words, like we in the South like to say, y'all, go through your Bible and change every word you into a y'all. Because Jesus says, y'all do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There are days when I don't like old annoying brother Mark, but I still love him and he's there for me and I'm there for him. When old Andrew seems so passive and unhelpful and yet he's there for me and sometimes I'm there for him. That's what living as if the Messiah is one of us means. And this is the beauty of the Bible story, but even more of the love that God shows for us in Jesus Christ, that indeed the Messiah is one of us. Jesus has said to us, whenever we gather, two or three of, two or three of us are gathered. Jesus is there. The Messiah is one of us in that gathering. And Jesus says, whatever we do for the least of these around us, we do it for him. The Messiah is one of us. This is, my dear friends, the great news of the love of God for us in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Having heard the word, let us now respond to that word by stating what we believe. Using a brief statement of faith written for the Presbyterian Church USA. Join me. We believe that in life and in death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now bring our joys and concerns before the Lord. In this prayer, I will Pause for a moment to be silent so that you can mention names of people who you would like to be lifted up to the Lord. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick are made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of coronavirus that we may experience your healing love. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Heal us from our pride, which can make us claim invulnerability to disease that knows no borders. Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Be with those who have died from the virus. May they be at rest with you in your eternal peace. Be with families of those who are sick or who have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Be with doctors, nurses, researchers, all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected and who put themselves at risk in the process, may they know your protection and peace. Be with leaders of all nations. Give them foresight to act with charity and concern for the well-being of people they are meant to serve. Give them wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for future but prepare for and even prevent future outbreaks. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Whether we are at home or abroad, surrounded by many people suffering from this illness or only a few, Jesus Christ, stay with us as we endure and mourn, persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. And now, dear Christ, we also pray for those in our own community, those who are suffering from any type of illness, who have suffered from loss, who indeed are suffering from anxiety or stress, from financial wor worries, or any kind of difficulty. We mention their name now.
Be with them, dear Lord, and comfort them. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, dear friends, as you go out into the world, remember this story. The Messiah is one of us. Believe it and live it. God already loves you. Now love yourself and others as an example and a testimony and a light to that love. And now, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace through the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.